podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode 111 of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors. I know, we were 111. And what we're <laughs> going to be talking about today is Therapy by Rote, to the Inexperienced Therapist. I love yes. that title, Bob. Yes. I was saying off air, uh, you know... I'd have to go back 45 years or whatever it is since I began. But I, I felt for a lot, quite a long time that I was doing therapy by rote. Me uh, too. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't feel very confident. Yeah. So, um, and what I mean by therapy by rote, it's a bit like, it's a bit like I, 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 I played chess for a long time. And recently I've stopped because it takes too much time. But anyway... And when you play chess, what you do, there's three part three it's like three games within one chess. You got the beginning game, which is opening moves, you got the middle game, and then you got the end game. And one game leads to one game, one leads to another game. And in psychotherapy, of course, when you first start, you know, usually with your placement clients, you're taught competencies and you know you in your training and so you've got some sense of competencies so that is what you start it's a bit like the opening moves you cling on to those things like staying behind the client yeah getting on track you know we have certain things which we're taught and because of lack of confidence and experience we cling on to that that's what i mean by yeah those. And I'm not saying that won't work uh, uh, at all because staying behind clients, getting contracts, uh, therapy being, you know, paced at the right speed, awareness of its human involvement. They're all, they're all very important uh, things to grasp hold of. And a therapist that just starts out or counsellor just starts out, they, they really have those um cornerstones to hang on to yeah of course um in those early days i think that it's important for the early beginning therapist to have these cornerstones to hold on to and they may be the cornerstones that actually develop the therapy and though it minimizes spontaneity it takes away risk, but at least it provides security and safety. Yeah, absolutely. I I remember in the early days feeling that, you know, therapy was very disjointed for me. <laughs> I'd have lots of notes and I'd have lots of things planned and prepared. You know, I, I didn't really pay much attention to this is going to sound terrible. I did pay attention to what the client brought in the room, but I planned for my own peace of mind, if that makes sense. So it was like, you know, if they don't come with anything, what we're going to fill an hour for? So I would have a, a plan of how it was going to be. That's what I mean by therapy by road in a way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and very important so, by the way, because you're then minimising your own anxiety. Yeah, well, it, it certainly helped me. <laughs> yeah, it's, a of, <laughs> it's a way of dealing with your own anxiety in the process. Uh, and important to have these uh, cornerstones and structures and um, early plans of uh, the way we see things. And even what you were saying then about, you know, having a beginning, a middle and an end. I can remember sitting there thinking, you know, dividing the 50 minutes up so that it's like 10 minutes to start off with or whatever, and then the 20-minute chunk in the middle and then another 10 minutes at the end of it and how the actual time would and, and watching the clock to to round it up. And, all yeah, it was very, very structured when I first started. I think it is for most people, and that's what I mean by therapy. by And there's nothing wrong with that, especially if you're beginning. So 
to use those structures to minimize your anxiety to feel soothed and in a way you'll start eventually to move from a less anxious place so you can actually hear the content of what the client is bringing absolutely yeah and when you say it like that i i didn't hear a lot of what well I, yeah i didn't i wasn't in the room a lot of the time i was in my head more than anything it's kind of like when you're learning how to drive everything is disjointed and it's you know you know looking in your mirror and pushing your gears down and doing all of that and there just comes a point where it's it's just more seamless yeah. but it, yeah it was a fair while, I think, before my therapy was seamless. I'm not even sure whether it is all the time now. <laughs> no, it'd be odd if it doesn't. But I, 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 wanted, I think it's important for the podcast people to think, uh, listening to us, um, uh, just to think about if, if you're still carrying on that process. You see, hopefully, as you get more experienced, you'll feel more able to take risks away from the sort of road or the structured sequence. Yeah. And you allow yourself to go into the world of intuition a little yeah. bit, creativity or even spontaneity. If you're going to keep on clinging on those to those cornerstones that I was just talking about, you know, um, pacing, attunement, involvement, all, all these different ones, then um creativity intuition intuition spontaneity can all um fall by the way there needs to be a sometimes a sometime in your experience i think this is a process never an event where you start to take a risk away from the structured sequence of therapy which you've been so used to yeah now, when does that happen is the bit i think that happens as you become more experienced and you even perhaps you know develop some of your own style yeah i think that's that's important is when we start to develop our own style absolutely yeah i can re i can remember feeling really exposed when I was starting to try and make my own because you that's one of the reasons why we did this podcast behind closed doors because you don't observe other people giving therapy so we don't know how we're meant to do it a lot of the time and there's never one way but what happens in the training people and this is in some ways there are many ways to train therapists but this is how I was trained I suspect you were trained you learn different theories, different treatment plans, different ways of doing things. I was remembering in my early days of training, that book came out, uh, Personality Adaptations. Yeah. Uh, looking at the different adaptations, schizoid, paranoid, you know, uh, historical. I've actually got that on my desk as we speak. I love that book. Yeah. Yes. TA Today and Personality Adaptations are my two most favourite books. <laughs> okay, I do not want you to hear what I'm going to say as a minimisation of this book. Uh, that's really important if it's one of your favourite books. So you have these different adaptations and different personality styles. And in that book particularly, they talk about the best way to work with each particular personality style. So, for example, a schizoid, somebody who's schizoiding and withdrawing, you would go a certain way and follow certain channels. And there's three different channels. There's the open door, the target door, and the trap door. You're smiling, I suspect, because you know this book so well. You're uh, describing me to a T when I first started doing this. I would read that chapter on how to work with that personality type. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so a client that sees the world through feelings is histronic. Therefore, you need to... Uh, make sure that the open door is through feelings and then thinking and xxx and if you follow this path that is said in this book this will happen and the person will get better yeah and they're great structures to hold on to yeah and i did hold on to them and to know them <laughs> yeah. and they may work and that's and 
What I don't want to happen, though, is the therapist follows those ways of being or that type of therapy for the next 30 years. No. It's okay to have it in their heads. Yeah. But I think to actually develop their own style as well as sort of having the security and safety of following these particular you know, processes is also important. Yeah. So yeah. even though that might be your favorite book, I, I know for absolute certainty that you have developed your own style and, and uh, you know, it isn't like that. that. That's what I'm just talking about. No, no, but I can, I, well, as you were talking, I can remember literally reading those chapters on how to work with all the different personality types in my early days. Yeah. And it was a security blanket that if all else fails, do you know what I mean? I've got this knowledge, but you do learn to use your intuition and go with certain things, you know, knowing what personality adaptation the client is, is always helpful, but then using that it's a the way that I do it. Yeah. It's a wonderful piece of theory as is so many other pieces of wonderful pieces of theory. Yeah. But, you know, the different modalities. But if it becomes your own, if it becomes a black and white safety blanket, you're trapped in your own process. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and everybody's different. Everybody is unique when they come in and to just do the same thing with every client day in, day out. It's not, there's something that kind of came up for me when you were talking then. And I'm thinking, I actually miss part of it Be being an experienced psychotherapist now i have just realized that sometimes i lose touch with a client who's new that's coming in that it's new for them that they haven't experienced any of this before and i think i'm thinking now that i miss an opportunity to put them at ease oh. and I, ne I need to start doing that with new clients oh. Because me being a new therapist, when I was seeing a new client, I think we met on the same, do you know what I mean? Just familiarising ourselves with the space and the room. And I always offer them a cup of tea or coffee now if they're a new client, but just to give them time to acclimatise to being in the room. I don't think I give them the opportunity to do that anymore. Yes, it's, a, it's interesting that... that you can pick up on that and think of yourself well this is the loss perhaps yeah so when i moved in this sort of experienced place that you're sort of feeling the loss of perhaps those early days yeah i haven't thought about my early days for a long time but <laughs> i think i think you know it, it, it in the assessments i do at the institute I do, do a lot of them where I assess, make an assessment in half an hour um, of you know what they want and we talk between each other and then I pass them on to a therapist of their choice. Quite often I say, as they're telling their story and everything, I often say, you know, in the psychotherapy business, two and two doesn't necessarily make four. Even though we can look at like this, this way, yeah. sometimes makes five. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Even though I've said X, X, and X, when you go to your new therapist, just take that as a hypothesis. Um, yeah. A black and white process. And, it's, and again, I know it's very important for people who are trained to be psychotherapists to learn these theories, to be able to talk about clinical, you know, clinical work into, or clinical theory into practice. And I know it's a, whole process a bit like that what you talked about learning to drive yeah eventually we do that and you know hopefully in the end we are able to uh, go beyond these theories because one of the things i want to go over this podcast is sometimes if we follow everything by rote we lose the person in front of us yeah we lose the relationship with the client because we're more you know concentrated on these 
theoretical structures. Yeah, I think for me, one of the things in the early days, and I can actually remember taking this to my supervisor, was a, a, a huge fear of mine. What if I get it wrong? Mm. Uh, yeah. That really was my biggest fear. What if I cause more damage in that room? Very, very, and very get common, it wrong. Yeah. Very common fear for when we start seeing our early clients. And what did your supervisor say? I think she actually said that you can't do any more damage to them rather, you know, more than what they're coming with, if that makes sense. You know, you've had the training, you've got all the information, you know what to do. And it, I think I, it was, I just needed some sort of reassurance, but that was my biggest fear is that I would, yeah, I would do more damage. <laughs> How did you get that uh, reassurance? <coughs> and I agree with your supervisor. Yeah. It's kind of like my my son was, I can remember he was in the military, as were you, Bob. Um, and I used to worry about him and he used to say to me, I've been <clears throat> trained how to do this, mum. I know what to do. And I think that's what it all comes down to is having the training. You know, that that's the backup that allows you to know what to do in that room. Yeah, I was watching a programme on television about the training of the Marines. And when I was in the army, um, it was the, it was the people people were the most sort of um, crackers. I thought <laughs> forward uh, to actually go want to be commandos or whatever it is at that high level. And I was watching uh, the program about what commanders in their early training to get the green beret have to go through yeah. to get their green beret. And uh, my God. Now, four days of, you know, really physical uh, things that they have to do, um, as well as you, you know, using a lot of other things. But what the person said at the end of it, as they gave the green beret to these people who'd gone through all these physical trainings and everything else, they said, OK, now you've got the green berries, it all begins, you know, yeah. life begins. However, you will have had this training repetitively over the last year, which will you know, will integrate, I don't think he said that word, it's mine, and uh, hold you in good stead when you're actually in the field. Yeah. And in this way, it's the same for our training. That's exactly how it feels. You're out in the field and you've had the training. Yeah, absolutely. So the training is the structures. And then yeah. eventually you will, I hope, start to integrate the you know, your trainers, you know, develop your own style. And I hope move away from therapy by road, or at least if you are going to continue that way, to develop your own style and, you know, maybe take some clinical risks with your supervisor's advice and develop levels of spontaneity in your own uh, way of being in the therapy room. Yeah. But your training is the starting point, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And it is, it's having that grounding that you can always fall back on, that you you know the stuff. Yeah, you're not making it up. It's <laughs> You've done the training. Well, Scopey came out. Uh, well, perhaps I won't go down that road. But I think it's very important that training isn't just six weeks or six months. You know, I think to be a competent psychotherapist, you need four, five, six years. Yeah. You need because of the reasons we're just talking about here. Yeah. Yeah. When when I look back, there, there was something I saw on um, Facebook the other day. I think it was, you know, NLP training in a weekend and cost you seven dollars or something. <laughs> and it was it was scary to think that people would use that and then start potentially to, to see people. No, the more comprehensive training, the more competent the training the more you'll have a platform to be able to use your imagination, creativity, spontaneity, and all the things I've just been talking about to develop your own style and have uh, your own originality in the world of therapy. Yeah. That might be an interesting podcast to yeah. Bob, about how do we find our style? What is, you know, what, how do I, because I, I often say, 
you know, to clients, I'm a bit like Marmite. Some people get me and some people don't. And I'm okay with that. I know I'm not for everybody. I think one of the ways, by the way, is having the courage to take risks with clinical support, you know, with the soup. So you, you can talk about the clinical risks or the risks that you're going to do with the supervisor, but you actually take that step. Yeah. And it's always for the good of the client as well. It's not your ego or doing, you know, some random thing in the room. It's got to be for the benefit of the client. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so that's taken as well, I hope, but you are right. There's many narcissistic therapists, unfortunately, who they keep their ego in the room and lose sight of the client, but in the service of the client is a very important sentence. Yeah. But yeah, I, th I think it's good to to find our own style and our own unique way of, of you know, doing the wonderful training that we all get at MIP in Manchester. <laughs> and, and, you know, can you tell, if you see therapists or things, can you tell that they, you, they've done your training or where they've had training? Oh, uh, interestingly, now I can. So when I used to go to conferences, well, I still go to conferences, um, you know, and go to TA conferences, take that, or integrative conferences. But I'll t talk about TA conferences because I've been at a lot of them. Uh, when I, the most important thing isn't, um, you know, about well, the most important thing when you're talking about TA therapists isn't just say somebody says they're a TA therapist. It's like where did you train? Because wherever they trained will be the style of TA that they then incorporate. Yeah. So. At MIP is a very relational, integrative psychotherapy training, um, yeah. which has TA as its bedrock. Whereas you can, might go somewhere else where it's much more redecisional or it's more a shorter or, 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 or whatever, but it has a different style to it. Yeah. So yeah, the answer is yes. I could usually tell the way they talk about how they work because that's the bit. If you're going to come here, you're going to put relationships relationship top and you're going to think about integration as the uh as the goal for cure yeah for example and your ta will be the bedrock for that whereas that might not be the way to another training institute but what I, one thing i do know though psychotherapists have four five six years of training before they get, say, UKCP registered. So they get a really good comprehensive training to be able to learn and practice and develop their style. Yeah. In the world today. And again, you know, one of the things that I, I always sing, you know, the Manchester Institute of Psychotherapy phrase is that, you know, we passed our competencies at kind of at the end of year two, but yeah, then yeah. we're still in training for another two years. So we're handheld for the next two years, which I thought was absolutely amazing. Oh. Yeah, I, I feel sad when people go through, say, a two year training or one year training because they don't have the support. No. Of training, I think, training support, if you like, they're left alone uh, to fend for themselves. They haven't, they haven't got that backup of training. Yeah, I think that's so important when we're talking about developing our own style and uh, being able to encompass, you know, therapy by rote as well as our own unique original style. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got your own style, and um, I've got my own style, and we're both trained in transaction analysis, and it's it's a process and never an event what i'm talking about here i use that quote so many times bob <laughs> no, it's a process never an event yeah. i like that i've said it for 40 years so but i think it's very apt in in, in the world of psychotherapy yeah absolutely and i, I just want to say to you know any newly qualified psychotherapists that are listening to this that you know you've you've got the training you've you've done the work yeah That's absolutely true. Yeah. And, it, you know, there is, I can remember moments of imposter syndrome and thinking, I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. 
you know, and, and that's okay too. It's about taking it to supervision and it's about, you know, knowing your own limitations. I can remember referring on, you know, if I, I had a client that I knew I wasn't capable of working with, that I would refer them on. So it's it's about knowing your limitations in the early days as well, I think. Yeah, and, and uh, I think throughout, throughout the whole of my reign of being a clinical psychotherapist, supervision and my own therapy were pivotal mm. in giving me that sort of ability of self-reflection, security and confidence. So that I yeah. didn't, I wasn't on the road by myself. That, that, yeah, absolutely. I had somebody with me who... Um, was part of the process yeah and having your own personal therapy it's a form of self-care as well i think it's you know it's it's good it's a good modeling role to your you know clients oh it's, it's, you know it's absolutely essential yeah everybody should have therapy bob totally agree yeah uh, now another podcast that it pre <laughs> we did it i think three i don't know a month ago or something we're talking about was therapy a middle class profession? Yes. Yeah. And money. So I think you're completely right. Everybody should have therapy. And then there's the whole process of how do people get therapy who, you know, haven't got that yeah. affordability, ableness. Yeah. Absolutely. The waiting lists are so long at the moment as well. Um, so I'm not sure what we're doing next time, Bob. Well, I sent you another big list. You've sent me another big list. I've I've got a few ones here, and one of them is working with loneliness as a clinical condition. Yeah, that's a good one. Another one is loving hating therapy. Well, let's do both of those. One okay. of my favourite records of all time, the probably, um, <laughs> perhaps was why I picked this title, but it's apt to therapy, was by Leonard Cohen. And uh, the album was called Love and Hate. Oh. Uh, and uh, it was all, all the, all the, <laughs> all the uh, songs were quite, I don't know what they were, but they were about love and hate in life. My dad always said that there's a very thin line between love and hate, and I never understood what he meant until I was an adult. <laughs> I thought he was spot on. <laughs> I see it in the therapy room a, a lot. So yeah. I thought that would be good. So I certainly like to talk about that. And I'd also like to talk about, you know, the concept of loneliness in the therapy process and how it's presented. Yeah. How it comes up and what we do about it. Yeah. So those two good ones. Okie doke. Right. So until next time, Bob, thank you so much. Yes. Goodbye, everybody. And of course, to you, Jackie. Take care. You. Bye bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show. Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.